Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Come and get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying encounters. I post new videos every day, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell, and you'll be notified when new daily content arrives on my channel. All right, let's get right into it. I was living alone in a mobile home in the woods adjoining Shawnee National Forest. I decided to go for a walk in the woods because I was bored and was thinking about shooting my rifle a bit. Nothing special. Just what I normally did as a youth. Since I'm not much of a people person, I spent a lot of my youth in the woods. I was walking up a field road that passed through a patch of woods that led to a larger field on top of a hill, a few hundred feet away. As I got halfway up the hill, I was suddenly shocked by a very loud whistle that was quickly followed by a scream that I had heard many times before as a kid. I knew from previous experiences that I didn't want to hang around, even though I was armed to the teeth. I was 19, going on 20 at the time, and I've spent a majority of my youth spending time alone in the woods, hunted almost every day in that area that could be legally hunted. So I know what the normal sound of the woods are, and no, it wasn't a swine, a bear, a raccoon, or any other such creature. The scream I heard instantly filled me with fear, even though I had an 8 millimeter. Hakim Mauser 12 gauge shotgun and a 22 caliber pistol. I always went hunting, heavily armed, because I have stumbled across Sasquatch a few times before and decided that next time I'll be more prepared. I was about halfway up the hill when I heard the scream a few ridges over. One to four miles away from me, I quickly turned and decided to call it a night. As I was walking down the hill, I heard another scream at the top of the hill I was walking down. Either they can run like heck, or there were two. Before I got to the bottom of the hill, I then decided that although I had a lot of weapons and ammo, this wasn't anything I wanted to shoot alone at night with only a maglite taped to my barrel. I figured running for the road would take too long and a more direct route would be better. So, I cut across the field and jumped the creek behind my house. I guess I didn't notice till after I had crossed the creek, but it had followed me home, which wasn't far, maybe a few hundred yards. I can tell you that to keep up with a terrified 20-year-old running faster than ever before, that thing had to be extremely fast. I stood by the back porch and could hear its heavy breathing and growling. It sounded kind of like a horse that had just run till it was winded, but the breathing wasn't labored. It was breathing in a normal, rhythmic tone, not labored. I was terrified because even after firing a few rounds in its direction, I could still feel its presence and hear it. So I unloaded in that direction. I fired over a hundred shells through the Hakim, a full box of shells from the 12 gauge and every shell I had for my 22 before I ran in the house to grab more ammo and turn some more lights on. I must have shot around 150 or more shells. I figured that I had shot at it enough and I wanted to save what ammo I had left in case it decided to try to come in for a visit during the night. So, I went in the house and stayed awake all night. The next day, about noon, I decided to go see what I hit. When I crossed the creek, I could plainly see where I had fired because of the holes in the trees and the saplings that were broken from bullets. Found no blood, no footprints, it was dry, but I did find something I didn't expect. It had laid down when I began shooting and must have been there for a while because there was a flattened area that looked like a deer bed. Although deer do frequent the area, I sincerely doubt it was deer because there was no scat, and deer scat a lot 
in and around their beds, as well as a good quarter of a mile from the nearest deer trail. I'm an experienced woodsman, and I have never run across a creature that was smart enough to lay down and stay put while bullets were flying over its head. Animals just don't have the reasoning it would take to exert that type of behavior. Like I said, I never saw it. I just heard it and heard its footfall. It was absolutely two-legged. It was huge. I don't think it wanted to say hello. Not sure what it wanted, but it was definitely very intelligent. That was the only event of this nature during the time I lived there, six years. Oh yeah, I don't remember smelling its body funk till after I had started shooting. Maybe it wasn't close enough for me to smell it, or I was just too scared. Either way, approximately 10 to 11 p.m. Very dark woods near my home, starry night, full moon, hot and dry. The weather was clear and still, no wind, deciduous trees on a floodplain surrounded by hills and a creek near the Mississippi River bottoms. It was a hilly yet swampy area. There were several deer slain in the area in the weeks preceding the incident, but I believed it to be the work of local coyotes, wolves, and large cat. There was an incident where some friends were driving around a cemetery that's close to the Ohio River near Mounds. It was later at night. They told me about seeing a Bigfoot that began chasing them. They said they were doing about 30 miles per hour or so, and it was gaining on them. So, once they got off the gravel drive, and the road straightened, they sped up and lost it in the shadows. They were in an old Ford-type El Camino, with several people riding in the back that witnessed the event. However, I doubt it's true for the simple fact that there were a bunch of drunken loudmouths and I really didn't believe them. They had a knack for trying to outlie each other, and their stories just didn't match when they told me about it at a later date. On to the next one. Sound of bumps in the night at Staunton Lake, Alton Telegraph, Macoupin County. A foul-smelling creature that witnesses said may have been a Bigfoot apparently slipped away from Staunton Reservoir without a trace. Cheryl Campman and Eric Shelty reported hearing what may have been a large creature running up a hill on the south side of the lake at about 1.30 a.m. Monday. We were sitting out near the beach when we heard the shuffle of leaves and three loud thumps. Eric said it sounded like the creature was pulling up trees causing a lot of damage. There was a terrible, rotten fish smell mixed with the odor of algae when the pond turns over. It's hard to describe, but it's pretty potent. Later Monday morning, as deputies with flashlights comb the area, Cheryl said she heard a growl and a roar from across the lake. At first, I thought someone was fooling with a public address system, but the sound wasn't near the cars, and the car doors were not open. It sounded like a cross between a lion and a grizzly and lasted three to four seconds. Eric and his girlfriend, both 21, come to the lake often, usually during daytime, usually to catch cappies and bath. They said they have never encountered anything like Monday morning's episode. Neither have police and sheriff's deputies who found no evidence of a foul odor or even one footprint. Authority said, we didn't really see anything because it was so dark and cloudy, but we heard it on the side of the hill. We first thought it was someone goofing off, Cheryl said. Police advised us to clear out and we did, but the two can't help believing there may be something to the Bigfoot legend. It could be, Eric said, looking across the water to the curve of inlets surrounded by trees. Well, if you find him, let me know, Staunton Police Chief Larry Gerbeck said, but calm him down first. Macoupin County authorities said that the spring sighting may be related to a recent Bigfoot documentary on television. I think my kid was watching the movie on cable last week, Garbuck added. On to the next one. I lived in a small mining community called Red Lake, Ontario for a few years. 
One day in the fall, I saw something that I can't quite explain when I was hunting moose with a friend of mine. I've tried to rationalize what I was looking at on that day, and I just can't explain it. I must also say, I've only told four other people on the planet this story, for obvious reasons. Only my closest friends, who know that, of course, I'm not crazy. And my father has heard this story and believes what I saw. We had driven into a trail that I had not only been on before from a road that we hunted regularly. The main road was called Dixie Lake Road. I don't know if the trail has a proper name or not. I doubt it as there are hundreds of side roads and trails out of there. My friend had told me that he had been on this trail a few times and had spotted a big bull one day earlier that summer. And he said he also saw several birds, partridge, sharp tails, and ruffled grouse. Whenever he rode this trail, as a kid, we would go blueberry, raspberry, Saskatoon berry picking with my family up there. As I got older, my friends and I hunted this road all the time. I had been on this road many times throughout my life, but this was the first time I'd ever ventured on this particular side trail. We were about two kilometers up the trail from the main road when my friend slowed his four-wheeler down. I pulled alongside of him and he said this was the area that he had saw the bull a couple of months ago. I told him I was going to stop and have a snack on this straight stretch of trail. I had packed a lunch that was in my backpack. He said he was going to ride on ahead to the end of the trail, which he said was only about another kilometer or so further, and scout the area and look for any signs of moose. He rode ahead, and I pulled to the side of the trail and turned off my bike and took off my helmet. I opened my pack and grabbed a sandwich and a pop and started snacking. My friend rode off ahead toward the end of the trail. He was still close enough that I could hear his bike revving in the distance. I could see about 200 meters up the trail and about 50 to 75 meters back down the trail from where we came in. I suddenly heard the same noise up ahead, about 75 to 100 meters to the right of the trail. This was right where my friend had just ridden past, not more than two minutes prior. The sound was brush moving, and I could even make out what sounded to me like the thud of footsteps over the sound of my friend's bike in the distance. At this time, I stood up, put my sandwich down on the seat of my bike, and started retrieving my .30-06 from the case stored on the back of my quad's rack. All the time, I was keeping my eye on the area I was hearing the noise from. I had my gun case open, and I was just about to pick up my rifle, when, for no real reason, I just kind of froze and waited and watched. I fully expected to see a moose or a bear come out of the brush on the side of the road. I knew by the commotion that it was going to be a fair-sized animal. I remember thinking to myself, just wait to see what it is before you pick up your gun. Suddenly, the noises stopped completely, and about five seconds later, I saw it. Initially, I thought what I was seeing was another hunter. That feeling soon went away. It was definitely human-looking, but not quite. I'll always remember my initial reaction. I instantly said to myself, this joker is going to get himself blown away walking through the woods dressed in black like that. Within about two seconds, I realized I could not possibly be looking at a man. Whatever this was, took a couple of steps out from the brush on my right onto the main trail, stopped and looked away from me toward the area my friend had just ridden to. All I remember seeing was a massive black, very muscular arm a little point of a head from behind and wispy black hair swaying in the breeze off the arms. I knew for sure at this point I was not looking at a bear on its hind legs, nor was it a moose or a man. It then turned in my direction and looked right at me. It almost looked surprised to see me. I remember feeling a chill, for lack of a better word, coming over me and really realizing that what I was seeing was absolutely extraordinary. Amazingly enough, I still did not have my gun in my hands, the case was open, 
and it was just sitting there on the back of my bike. I was in absolute awe at what I was looking at. The creature kind of sniffed, then cocked its head back, gave a couple of more sniffs, and then a sort of grunt. It then calmly turned in the direction it was originally going and stepped down into the ditch, then across the little blueberry meadow and into the thick bush, all the while walking on two legs, making no noise whatsoever. I remember trying to rationalize what I was seeing, saying to myself, this has to be a homeless person or someone living in the bush. But nothing I could say to myself was making much sense. For starters, it was at least seven feet tall, covered in fine, wispy black or dark brown hair, two to three inches long, except for its face and palms. It was muscle on muscle. I'd never seen anything so powerful looking. It looked like a football player in full equipment, but it didn't have that V shape to its torso, more square and blocky looking. It was at the very least 400 pounds, but I would not be surprised if it weighed as much as 600 pounds. It was at least as heavy as the biggest black bear I have ever seen. I wasn't a small kid either, six feet and 200 pounds, and this thing would make me look like a dwarf. Only after it left the area, is when I got this kind of scared feeling like I don't even believe whatever this thing was is completely gone. It wasn't really a rational feeling as the animal I saw made no threatening movements or anything. And I had a 30 odd six, but I was still frightened and felt just plain weird. I then picked up my gun and started walking very cautiously up the trail towards where I saw it go into the bush, never taking my eyes off that spot. I got up to the area and stood in the middle of the trail, staring at the point where I last saw it and waited for my friend to return. Finally, after about four or five minutes, I heard his bike getting louder, which meant it was closer. He crested the hill about a hundred meters from me and drove towards me. He stopped about five feet away from me and immediately asked me what was wrong and what did I see? He told me he thought I had seen or shot at a moose. I asked him if he had seen anything weird in the last few minutes. He told me no, not at all. I then said that I saw some crazy old homeless guy. I said it kind of nervous and laughing. We both kind of chuckled about it, but then he asked me if I was serious. I told him, yeah, and proceeded to tell him exactly what I saw only after swearing him to secrecy. He was a good friend, and I knew not only could I trust him, but he would probably believe me. We both agreed that what I saw could not have been a naked guy running through the forest at that time of year. It was late October and the temperature was around 0 to 5 degrees Celsius. Anyone without clothes on would probably be frozen to death in a matter of hours. What struck me as odd though is the way this creature's hair was. It was wispy and not really thick or warm looking like that of a bear or a moose. You could see patches of skin through the hair. It certainly didn't look like it was adequate protection against the severely cold winters we get up here. Negative 40 degrees Celsius is not uncommon throughout January and February. I just have a hard time believing whatever I saw could survive those extreme temperatures, and also the fact that we were miles from any town or campground, and there was no other vehicles on the road or on any of the trails. We got to Dixie Lake Road at about 6.15 a.m., parked the truck about 20 kilometers in and got the bikes out of the back of the truck and started riding soon after. This incident happened at about 7.30 to 8 a.m. and we know for a fact that we were the only ones up there that morning. Even when we left for the day right after this incident, there were no other vehicles parked there or driving in. After discussing several scenarios and trying to figure out what was going on, my friend then shut off his bike and got off and we decided to look for signs or tracks. There was a little light dusting of snow on the ground, not even a half a centimeter, and it was mostly blowing around and not sticking to the surface of the ground. We could make out the marks on the ground where something had obviously passed, but nothing definitive. About one minute into our search for tracks, we were on the side of the trail where I had seen the creature last. We were about 10 feet off the trail in the blueberry meadow, Suddenly, we heard one single very loud bang coming from the area behind the tree line where I last saw the creature. 
It sounded like someone smacked a tree with a baseball bat. My friend and I quickly looked at each other to say to each other, did you do that? Or did you just throw a rock into the bush when I wasn't looking? After that look, we both realized the noise was not made by either one of us. We took off. I just ran the 100 meters back to my bike in about 15 seconds with my rifle in hand and full hunting gear on. By the time I reached my bike, my friend had already jumped back on his quad, started it and raced down beside my bike just as I had gotten there by foot. He kept telling me to hurry up and kept looking over his shoulder. I put my gun back in the case, knocked the pop and sandwich off my seat, threw my helmet on without the strap and started my quad and turned around and followed my friend out of there at speeds that weren't exactly safe. We got back to his truck and loaded the quad. We then got back to my place my friend and I told the story to my father. Since that day, I've only discussed it with my father three or four times, and the same goes for the friend who is with me. The story you have heard is 100% accurate and truthful, and not embellished in any way. The events described are exactly how they happened. I sincerely don't care if whoever hears this believes my story or not. I saw what I saw. I do not want to draw any attention to myself. This is the reason why I never reported this or told anyone but a couple of my closest friends and my dad in 15 years. It seemed to be extremely quiet when I was having a snack on my quad until I heard the animal approaching. The only sound I could hear was my friend's quad way off in the distance. No bird noises or other sounds of the forest. Just eerily calm. It was morning, complete daylight, mostly sunny with only a few clouds in the sky. Crisp and cool, zero to negative five degrees Celsius, slight breeze, no more than 15 kilometers an hour, if that. The side trail off the main road, Dixie Lake Road, mostly jack pines and spruce with a few poplar and birch. Many meadows in the area with wild berries. A lot of flat bedrock areas exposed in the area. Some small marshes and ponds and a river to the north of Dixie Lake Road that runs along as the road goes north or longer as far as I know. On to the next one. According to the Kentucky Post, member of the Jones family encountered a shorter version of Bigfoot, perhaps a young male, one night in March. The incident took place in Big Bone Lake, Kentucky, the birthplace of paleontology, Boone County, the creature was reported only four or five feet tall, weighing an estimated 300 pounds, with broad shoulders and a flat face. It was bold enough to approach the family's mobile home, shaking the door and causing alarm. When the thing attempted to overturn the trailer, it was fired on by the man of the house to no effect. It simply ran away on all fours and effected its escape by leaping into the nearby Ohio River and swimming north. Police investigations revealed nothing save for the fact that the area has a history of monster activity. The Jones family alone claims to have had several more run-ins with the creature on the property. Several articles about sightings of the creature in the area are known to have been written. The following is a reprint from the Creature Chronicles number no. 2 summer issue. Large black unknown animals sighted in Big Bone, Kentucky, in Boone County, approximately 25 miles southwest of Cincinnati, Ohio. Witnesses, Jackie Jones and David Schultz. Jackie, David, and son Jackson were ready to retire for the night when they suddenly heard an unusual sound coming from the boat dock. They said the noise sounded like a combination of a lion and elephant roar. Jackie turned on the outside light, which connected to the boat dock, when they saw an outline of something moving in the weeds. The object was estimated to be between two to three feet wide, around 300 pounds, five feet in height, and seemed to have a flat face. However, no eyes, ears, or snout could be seen due to the darkness. The two witnesses also said that the animal tried to jerk their trailer home around as if trying to push it over. Dave decided to go out and investigate. When the animal advanced toward him, he got scared and shot at the creature with a shotgun. The creature appeared to jump back into the river, Ohio River backwater, and quietly swam towards east. Days later, Dave was talking on the phone with investigator Earl Jones 
when something was heard outside the trailer. Jackie called for Dave, and again, he went outside to see what the disturbance was and hoping to get a better look this time. At this point, Jackie began to talk with Jones in a nervous and frightened manner. She was worried about her son possibly being harmed by this creature. Meanwhile, Dave saw the creature jumping over a ditch and again escaping into the water. Previously in June, the same trailer was occupied by Vicki Jones, Jackie's sister. She had an intercom connected to the boat dock and was hearing strange sounds, and they kept getting louder. Her dog began to howl, and she seemed scared of something. Then, all of a sudden, her trailer started shaking. The dishes started to fall off the shelves. Was this the same animal or something else? Through local legend and old newspaper clippings, John found out that this creature was also seen in 1950. He was also able to find several articles on a creature that was seen in the area on several occasions over the years. The name Satan was dubbed by the local resident. Case findings and conclusions. No definite physical evidence was ever found other than the spent bullet from Dave's shotgun that were found lodged in a large tree down by the river. So Dave did fire off a few rounds as he claimed. Various markings on the ground could not be distinguished as any prints. The Boone County recovery team sent drivers into the river, but could not find any evidence. Earl did not hear anything unusual while talking with Jackie. We are left with the testimony of the two witnesses who seem very sincere and still frightened as they relay their encounter on separate occasions. Their story has never changed. We never mentioned the term Bigfoot, because that fact was never established. However, the Boone County police officers say it's a possibility. One Richwood, Kentucky woman allegedly had a run-in with a Bigfoot creature in the summer in the backyard of her home in Arbor Glen Estate subdivision. She was out walking her dog, Charlie, when he suddenly stopped and began growling at the fence line beyond which was a small creek. She looked and straight in front of her, about 50 feet on the other side of the fence, was a most unusual and frightening figure. I distinctly remember the creature, she said. He was tall, well over six feet high, and he was an off-white color with shaggy hair that dangled a little bit, maybe three to five inches long in places. The face was a mix between a human and a primate, not an ape, not a human dressed up. It stood up from a squatting position and looked at her, revealing a muscular body with a short neck and long arms that reached to mid-thigh. After staring at each other for a few minutes, the witness claimed the thing just turned and ran off into the woods. She felt obliged to do the same, straight back inside the house. The witness also claimed that her father had seen a similar creature, also tall and off-white colored, sometime earlier near a creek on Shady Lane in Crittenden, Kentucky. Night yowlers were also heard in Constance, Kentucky. On to the next one. I will always remember this because it still sends shivers down my spine, wrote Ashland, Kentucky resident Dawn. It was just after midnight one evening in August. My boyfriend and I were driving to his house from mine and we were on 168. This was when the 168 had no homes built and no streetlights as it does now. I was talking to my boyfriend when I noticed he was really quiet. He slowed down and said, Did you see that? And I said, See what? He hit his brake lights and when I turned around and looked out the back window, I saw a 7 to 8 foot tall shadow from the lights looking at us while it was crossing the road. I was terrified and he hit the gas and we were gone. I know what we saw, and it was a Bigfoot. Dawn further describes the thing as being covered with dark brown to black hair all over its body. Two more Ashland residents, this time a mother and her son, witnessed an extremely tall creature with long, stringy hair as it crossed the road one night. According to the mother, its stride was so immense that the monster crossed the road a distance of at least 20 feet easily in only two steps. Ashland is an extremely active area for hairy monsters. It seems seven years earlier, a similar creature also described with long stringy hair chased two witnesses into their car as they were investigating a local haunted bridge. 
it ran on all fours as well, but when it stood up, they claimed it was at least 16 feet tall. A smaller version of Bigfoot was seen in Boyd County by a local man, the Reverend Joshua Sparks, and his five-year-old son one October evening around 8 p.m. My son and I were walking in the woods, Sparks later said, off the country road known as Greenfield Road, which connects to Shops Creek and Hurricane Hollow. We had recently discovered some tree breaks and teepee structures in that area. As we walked, my son pointed and said, Daddy, there's a Bigfoot. I said, where? And he pointed to a location about 50 yards above us on a ridge. There was a Bigfoot creature standing at the top of this ridge. It acknowledged that we were there with a grunt. It then proceeded to break in half a small tree and began hitting a larger tree with a stick. We stood there frozen and not wanting to leave. It then began walking towards us and let out a moaning scream and grunted. I felt then that we had worn out our welcome and I took my son and slowly walked away. We were there maybe five minutes at the most. Sparks described the creature as being covered with black hair, upright and at least seven and a half feet tall and weighing about 350 to 400 pounds. It was dark and my flashlight didn't grant me the ability to see its face, he said. It did have a distinct odor to it, an outdoor odor. An alleged big footprint was found in Cattlesburg, also in Boyd County as well, in late January after one family heard a disturbance outside their bedroom window the previous night. On to the next one. My former husband and I had taken our children for a picnic at Wellington Lake just south of Buffalo Creek, Colorado. What I saw was not the same as what I've seen in photos, however. What I saw was a bipedal creature with white fur. This may sound strange, but I was talking with my former husband when the creature stepped out from behind a boulder. I told my now ex-husband to look. He turned around, but the creature ducked back behind the boulder. My ex-husband turned back to me and said, I didn't see anything. At that very moment, the creature showed itself to me again. I told my ex to turn around. He did, and the creature ducked behind the boulder again. This happened four or five times, and then the creature was gone. The creature was partially bipedal and then would stoop like an ape and touch the ground. It had a human-like feeling about it. Because... It was obviously playing some sort of game with me. I have never told anybody, except for people I trust, to not make fun of me. I was a resident in the area for many years, and I knew what wildlife was there. Nothing came close to this creature. I've seen mountain lion, bobcat, lynx, badgers, deer, elk, bear, and many more creatures in that area. But nothing like this. The creature was very quiet light on his or her feet. It was not as large as Bigfoot, and the fur was pure white like a polar bear. I didn't get a clear vision of its face. This was not a polar bear. We lived in Colorado, where there were only black bears. In addition, the creature was obviously clever and had a sense of humor and intelligence that was human-like. Again, it was not incredibly tall, maybe five foot nine or so, it wasn't a person playing a prank either. It was too agile and too fast. And that area is wilderness area. Very difficult for a human to scamper around so quickly. Over boulders and up mountains, etc. Unfortunately, I was the only witness. I am perfectly sane and I am educated with a master's degree in education, instructional technology. I'm the type of person that has my feet set directly onto the earth. In other words, I don't believe in anything that I can't see. I don't take drugs, and I didn't take drugs then either. Nor did I drink alcohol. I would like to know if anybody else has seen this creature or a creature similar to it. I was too embarrassed to mention the incident to cowboy types in that area. I've always wanted to know what I had witnessed, but too afraid to mention it because it was different than the photos I've seen of Bigfoot. It was in the afternoon, Around 2 to 3 p.m. On to the next one. 
At the time, I was a resident of Steamboat Springs, Colorado. Each elk season, we would put up an elk camp about 15 miles horseback only, northwest of Strawberry Park in the Mount Zirkle Wilderness area. On the opening morning, we were kept in camp by a rather heavy wet snow that did not stop until around 10 a.m., at which time the sun came out and we saddled up our horses to take a quick look for elk track, intending to return to camp for a quick lunch. On my return to camp, I cut a set of tracks that looked like a big barefoot person had passed by. These tracks were about 12 to 13 inches long with only four toes that I could see in a broad arch and eel area. I returned to camp and brought the camp cook back to look at them since they crossed the creek only about a hundred yards from our tent. I decided to follow the track and found where the creature had stood on the other side of the creek milling about as if trying to decide where to go. The tracks led uphill through the black timber, which I followed for about half an hour. The tracks had begun to interest my horse a great deal. He kept sniffing the track and became more and more skittish until, in an area of several big blowdowns, he refused to go any further and began to show signs of panic, which of course was transmitted to me. I took a hard left into a big avalanche area, which I followed for about 300 or 400 yards. The black timber, which I had just left, began to turn into aspen, so I cut back, hoping to require the track. Whatever it was, it was still in the black timber, spruce trees, and I didn't have much heart to go in and look. End of my story. I am an experienced woodsman. I have spent lots of times in the high country, on horseback, and have never encountered any tracks like these. And the horse in question I had was a great mountain horse, was not gun-shy or spooky in any way. His skittish behavior was the biggest reason I gave up the hunt on the track. He lived to be 40 years old and was with me from the time he was nine months. The only other witnesses were just the camp cook, my wife. It was around noon on a clear blue sky after a morning snowstorm in typical Colorado high country, with open parks, aspens, and black timber. Quite mountainous, of course. On to the next one. I moved to Castle Rock with one of my close relatives. The house was in town, so it took a little bit more to get at where I love to be. And that was out in the woods. My neighbor was my same age and shared the same interests as I. That entire summer, we spent fishing, hiking, camping, and off-roading in the Devil's Head Rampart Range area. I remember that we had tried to get into the area during the early spring. We had no luck with a two-wheel drive car. Around April, I purchased a four-wheel drive. We got in a few weeks after that. I remember going in because there was still snow still on the ground. When we got out of the Jeep, to our soon-to-be new home away from home, there were several tracks going through our campsite. The odd thing about the tracks and my first impression were what idiot took off his shoes to go hiking? The second odd thing, which I guessed it should have given me a clue is, but it didn't at the time, at least one and a half of my feet fit inside each print in the snow. And third, we were the first ones into the immediate area that spring. No one should have been hiking through here. Anyway, we had an enjoyable summer there. The last few fishing trips, we took along with us a few girls who also liked to fish. On the last trip, Sunday afternoon on September, the fish were not biting and the sun was starting to drop low into the horizon. The sun illuminated the hillside adjacent to where we were fishing. Since I was bored with the fishing, I went to relax on the tailgate of my jeep just laying there and looking at the hillside. All of a sudden, two trees stepped out of the forest and out onto the rocks on the adjacent hillside above. These were no trees. These were no bears. These things were big. They were dark, swung their arms, and walked upright. At first, my buddy and I thought it was some kind of joke. Some jerks were trying to mess with us. We yelled out to them. We tried calling them names to piss them off. Nothing worked. However, they disappeared around some big rocks, 
one of the girls swear she saw them heading down the hillside toward us. At that point, it was pure pandemonium. We threw as much fishing and cook gear into the jeep as we could. We still ended up leaving half of it there. That night, one of the girls brought over her dad's 38 snub nose revolver. We were going to go back for the rest of our gear and to look around for the walking trees. Shortly after she left my house, that night, my nosy relative found the revolver in my jeep. The relative called the police. I tried like hell to explain this one to the cops. The cops thought that we were up to no good that day. None of us did that sort of thing. That was a real kick below the belt coming from the cops. The other girl's father was a county sheriff. She was not allowed to hang out or fish with us ever again, even though she saw the same things as the rest of us did. The girl that brought over the gun, she told her brother about what we saw. He told her that he had been at a large outdoor party in that area about a month prior. Everyone there was drinking. He said that when he went to relieve himself behind some bushes, he walked right into one of these creatures. He dismissed the whole event and blamed it on the alcohol he had consumed. March rolled around. Day trips to the woods were kept restricted to a closer radius of a home. Another Sunday, my buddy and I were out exploring a site between Castle Rock and Franktown where an old dam once had been. Many years prior, the dam broke, creating a huge cavern in the stream bed that runs through. The caverns were neat for exploring. The sun was starting to go down, and it was getting cold. It was time to leave. We were clawing our way through thigh-high snow on the north side of the cavernous stream bed back to the car. About a half mile away from the car, we noticed a black object lying in a sandbar in the stream bed. We clawed our way over to the upper ledge of the stream bed. On the sandbar below was lying a head, a big decaying head. Lying on its side, it looked like an overgrown human's head with black shaggy hair on it. The eyes, lips, and nose were already gone. The head had massive square teeth running throughout the upper and lower jaw. I have seen all kinds of skulls before, from both wild and domestic animals alike. I have never seen another skull like this before or since. A human skull is the closest match to it that I've seen or can compare it to. To this day, I wish I would have braved the cold and cold water and waded out to get the head. Quite a few years after my experiences in Colorado, I've learned about the North American Bigfoot. Had I known about this in my youth, I might have been an indoor lover. I now have no real desire to go plundering through the woods as I used to do. My experiences were real and genuine. I now believe that Bigfoot was in my life more than I knew. On to the next one. Footprints were sighted by myself and a friend while winter camping behind Pikes Peak near Colorado Springs, Colorado. A friend and myself were winter camping in Pike National Forest outside of Colorado Springs. I don't really recall exactly what month of the year it was, but there was still abundant snow cover all around our camp area. After breakfast on a sunny morning, we decided to explore the area. The snow in the area was in many places up to our waists. After trekking through deep snow, we came upon a trail that was located on a rise from the valley floor. We followed the trail for a short distance when we came upon some very large footprints. Thinking how strange these footprints looked, the size and shape, we knew that they were not of any animal that we knew of. These footprints looked human except that they were very large. What would a bare foot huge person be doing way out here in the middle of winter. We were thinking. We followed the footprints for a while until we came to an area where two adjacent mountains joined. At that place, the snow became very deep and impossible for us to continue. The footprints, however, continued right up the area, never breaking stride and not overly disturbing the unbroken snow. After returning home and telling our story to our friends and families and being met with disbelief. We didn't discuss our sighting again until now. The footprint sightings were in the mountainous region about 7,000 to 8,000 feet behind Pikes Peak. A heavy snow covered most of the ground. On to the next one. 
Dispatch had sent out a call asking all available units to report to the scene of a domestic dispute. A woman was calling for help, saying that her husband was going to kill her with a sword. Now, any type of law enforcement officer will tell you that these are the worst types of calls to go on. Nationwide, many officers have been shot trying to defuse such situations. As soon as the call came over the radio, I was on my way with two other units. As I arrived at the location, which was a house trailer located deep into a wooded lot, car 605 was ahead of me. We got out of the cars and went to the door with our guns drawn. We could hear that there was a heated dispute still going on inside of the home, including lots of cursing and yelling coming from a man and woman. My partner pounded on the door shouting police while I watched standing off to one end of the trailer's home. Just after he knocked, the female voice shouted, Good, they're here. Now you're going to jail, you lowlife creep. Sounds after this, I heard a crash from the backside of the home, which was followed by the sighting of a man running out into a field while wearing nothing but a pair of shorts and sneakers, having forced his way out, jumping through a window. I shouted to my partner that we had a runner and started in pursuit of the man just as the third unit was arriving. Upon seeing me give chase to the man, the third officer started driving out into the field with his Bronco in pursuit of the same. It had been about 4 p.m. in the afternoon when the pursuit began, as I heard over the radio that the man was unarmed. I stumbled and fell, and at virtually the same time, the Bronco had reached a deep furrow that the truck could not cross. Now that officer and myself were both on foot chasing after this guy. The runner had already reached the wood, and additional backup was on the way as the two of us joined forces, entering the forest together. We spaced ourselves about 40 yards apart and started walking in. Now, a running man going into a desolate forest Wearing only a pair of shorts is not going to last very long. I must have been several hundred yards into the forest when I came across a creek and I radioed to my partner about the find. There was a slight embankment comprised of some moist brown soil that appeared drier as you moved away from the water. After I told my partner about the creek, he moved forward, coming across it himself. This officer was now going to move easterly looking for tracks the man might have left while crossing the creek, and I was going to follow behind him. Both of us believed that he had gone more in my partner's direction, as I was closing the gap between where I had started and where my partner had begun. I came across some gigantic impressions by the creek's edge. The impressions were so fresh that they were still filling with water from the wet soil. One of them looked to be two or even three feet deep, and the print had to have been close to two feet long and very wide. I radioed my partner immediately, telling him to backtrack to my position. We stood there, examining the, examining the track, and we could see one more print on the other side of the creek as well, indicating that something had crossed the creek here. Now, just so you can visualize this, the creek was about a foot deep at its deepest point and maybe 12 feet wide in total, including several feet of bank on either side, and there was no way that these tracks were those of the man we were chasing. We both walked through the water into the wood following the tracks, maybe 40 feet into the wood on the other side. We found a sneaker, and at this point, there was no reason for the two of us to go any further while alone. We retreated back to the field and my trailer. Our reinforcements had arrived already, and I presented the sneaker to the wife, who confirmed it was her husband. With the assistance of another agency, our office began a manhunt. We stalked out the various roads and areas where the man would eventually have to emerge, knowing that he couldn't last long in the woods with no clothing and one sneaker. After several days, the man had not been seen or taken into custody, and the wife said that she hadn't seen him in or near the property, and neither she nor any of their relatives had heard from him. During this time, the giant impression by the creek had been the topic of much discussion, as well as the sneaker we had found. Some felt that the print had been enlarged by the softness of the creek's edge, even after I had insisted they were not, since I had seen them within moments of when they had been made. After the passage of about two years' time, this turned into a missing person's case. 
The man still had not been seen in all that time. About three years later, some hunters came across human skeletal remains about five miles north of where the case had begun. They had been hunting in some thick timbers and found the bones in a patch of tangled briars. After the report, the remains were retrieved by our forensic people. After much examination, we believed that the bones belonged to our missing man. DNA was retrieved from the remaining spouse's child and it turned up as a match. The skeleton was that of the runaway man from some three years earlier. But here is the real clincher of the story and why I wrote you in the first place. According to the coroner, the man's skull had been caved in past the mid-sagittal line. In other words, the head had been smashed in more than halfway by blunt force trauma. Now, just to give you an idea of this type of force, if I was to take a full swing at your head with a large baseball bat, I couldn't even come close to this type of impact on your skull. Not even with two or three repeated forceful blows could I create such damage. Also, numerous ribs had been broken by a compound fractures. They were all clean fractures where the bone had been broken into two separate pieces. All of this must have occurred while the man was in the forest running and alone. On to the next one. This happened north of the Hoopa Indian Reservation in Humboldt County in California. There were about 10 of us watching the Perseid meteor shower from a clearing near an area where we were building a small cabin. Previously that summer, we had heard some moanings or low growlings up on the top edge of the property coming from the uncut Bureau of Land Management Forest, but did not think much of it. Everybody else got tired of watching the meteor shower. It was spectacular and went back to the cabin site. I was alone lying on my back in a clearing about a hundred yards from camp at about midnight, looking up at the stars and admiring the shower when I had the feeling of another presence. This seems to be a common phrase in these situations, but I have to say that this feeling of being watched is something I never felt before or after. It makes you wonder about some sort of a higher level of consciousness or something similar. I dare say telepathic. I got up and cut over to a logging road and went back to camp and was about 20 yards from camp when I heard a rustling off to my right just a few feet away in dense brush. I did not even look to see what it was. I just sprinted the rest of the way back to camp and did not say anything. We were having a good time listening to loud rock and roll music, car stereo with the trunk open, and drinking beer when a friend of mine said to me, do you smell that? What is it? Well, I had been noticing this odor, but I had not said anything. It smelled like a cross between an oil refinery, very sulfurish, and had an animal must smell to it, and was very, very strong. I recognized the animal mustiness from my trapping days as a youth, so I told my friend, this is an animal. My friend said it smelled like diesel fuel, and put out his cigarette. It smelled so strong. The smell was so strong that it seemed that it had to be right in front of your face. We figured it was coming from a particular stand of trees and decided to walk up and behind the stand to see if we could smell it. When we got behind the stand, we couldn't smell it, but when we got back downwind from the stand, we heard something take off downhill and downwind of us. All we saw was swaying brush where it had gone crashing down the mountainside. Some of the guys wanted to chase it, but I convinced them that since it had left, that we should leave it alone, if it left us alone. Well, in 15 minutes, the smell was back. This time, everybody in camp grabbed a gun. We had a lot of guns and decided to chase the smelly thing down, except for me and two others. I just had a flashlight. Well, they chased this thing out of the aforementioned stand of trees and could hear it and smell it, but could not see it. We could hear it stomping and thrashing around behind the stand of trees. They chased it up a narrow trail that led to a spring. I was bringing up the rear, but only had the flashlight, so I went back to camp with the other two that had remained. 
we now hear the hunting party about 50 or 60 yards up this narrow, difficult trail yelling, he's right up there, there he is. Then the yelling stopped for a few seconds. Then they started screaming. They came running out of the forest, single file, screaming in terror. They said they could hear and smell what they were chasing, but they could not see it. And then suddenly there was no sound or smell. At this point, they decided that whatever it was had stepped off the trail and they had run right by it. Well, this freaked them out and explains their hasty retreat. It was quiet the rest of the night, but a couple of mornings later, two of the guys were sleeping in a two-man tent on a hillside above the camp and woke the rest of us up at first light yelling. When we got to the tent, we found a huge turd about 18 inches from the front of the tent opening. It was about 4 inches in diameter and about 20 inches long and appeared to be mostly leafy material with some berry seeds. I guess that was his notice to us that he did not appreciate our company. It was uneventful for the rest of the summer. We also heard some moaning, growling sounds up in the forest prior. One account I have read described it as a howler monkey sound and I agree. I would like to touch on the scent of being lost. I feel certain that there are some sort of extra sensory facility at work here. I was in a meditative state while alone on a hillside and in a pure consciousness state. A state where there is no thought, just being awareness. I was in the process of expanding my field of consciousness when I felt the other presence. I feel like this may have been a factor in this episode, like maybe it was drawn to this awareness. I also never felt fear, even for a moment. On to the next one. My great-grandfather, Tobias Ralstorm, had an interest in a gold claim on the Rogue River back some time in the early 1900s. And I remember as a boy being absolutely enthralled with him the only time I ever saw the man. I was about 10 years old when this bearded, grizzled, and bent-over man stayed at my parents' house for a couple of weeks. I don't have too clear a recollection of why he stayed so long, but I remember when he arrived in our small home in the city of Rogue River, Oregon. What fascinated me most about this man was the fact that he was a real gold miner. My grandfather had worked at a mill until he was killed when a load of logs rolled off the rail car and crushed him. So, I never really knew my grandfather, but here was my living, breathing, great-grandfather, who, to my young mind, must surely be the spitting image of Davy Crockett. His leather shirt and pants fit my conjured-up image perfectly. Night after night, this spellbinding storyteller would keep us mesmerized in front of the fireplace, as he told us of his adventures along the Rogue River, and especially of the skunk ape, now known as Sasquatch, when it tore apart his cabin on the Rogue. I sat silently by, as the youngsters did in those days, enthralled by such excitement. Great Granddad talked about having built what sounded like a very crude log and mud structure down the river from a casual acquaintance of my father's named Cy Whitneck, who traded Dad gold for mining tools that Dad made in his time off during winters when they couldn't log due to the terrible conditions. We had some mentions of Mr. Whitneck in some paper when Rogue River was still Woodsville. Granddad said none of the miners were very close to each other's claims in those days because they all fiercely guarded their claims from thieves. I remember Grandad telling us this after all these years because I gave a report to my schoolmates on the topic on which Mr. Lenmark gave me an A. The reason I remember it so well is I must have drove my mom nuts as I recited it maybe a hundred times to practice. Anyways, it seems that Grandad caught two strangers on his claim and they exchanged words. The men refused to leave and one of the men fired a rifle at Grandfather, and he ran as fast as he could upriver to Mr. Whitneck's claim. They picked up another miner, 
and the three of them, with their guns, hurried down the well-traveled pathway above the river. As they neared the area where Grandfather's claim was, they heard several shots and ducked down quickly, realizing that the gunshots were not far from them. Then they heard a loud scream, and then another gunshot, and a very loud screech, and another scream. Going faster now, Grandfather said they came upon one of the men lying across the trail. His arm had been torn almost off, and he said the bones were sticking out and there was blood all over the leaves and ground. No wonder, when I was reciting this to my class, my teacher turned pale and sat down. The man had no pulse. Then he said they heard another scream further downriver, and they ran down the path. I remember my excitement of hearing the story interrupted by asking, What's a skunk ape? Granddad said to be patient as he was getting to that part. And he continued. He said around the next curve, there was a big, hairy, ape-like animal. It looked kind of like a shaggy ape, but it seemed to be much thinner and about seven feet or so tall. He said this animal is seldom a bother unless it's hungry or if you interfere with its young. It's highly protective from having encountered men before, and they seem to urinate when they are frightened, and oftentimes all over themselves, and it smells horrible. The local Indians call it Sasquatch. Anyhow, the animal just leapt to the side, and in two seconds, it had disappeared into the underbrush. Searching the area, they found blood at the rocky shore downriver, but no sign was ever found of the other claim jumper. The records show a fall as the cause of death for the man they did find, as in those days, nobody had time for inconveniences, because, as Grandad explained, it was too hard to find enough gold in that rocky place to waste time with things that were done with. And especially since the men were crooks after all, no one wanted to lose any more time on them. At my age then, this was the most excitement I'd ever had, and I made lots of notes. For a few weeks, I was the most popular kid in the school. Grandad had never really explained more about the skunk ape, because he said it was most often called a Sasquatch, or, as his group of miners down by Marialtown called it, Harry. And even though you think these men and their Indian wives would have communicated more, times were hard, so socializing was not as common as one would think. I've carried the memory of this experience all my life, and now my great-grandfather's story will live on. On to the next one. When I was around 10 years old, my fourth grade class took me on a field trip to a summer camp as part of our curriculum. It was, for the most part, an encounter that was rather ordinary. Activities including rafting, hiking, campfires, and subpar food in the mess hall. One of my friends did the typical thing that people do at movies and brought dirty magazines from their homes. Oh yeah, although our stay was scheduled to continue for four days, I was only able to make it there for around two. It was late in the night since I had remained up to perform the trash job and clean the mess hall. After I'd picked up the last granola bar wrapper, I made my way to the showers to clean up before going to bed for the night. I'm about halfway through when I hear a really loud shuffle coming from the direction of the showers. I cease what I'm doing and listen carefully, but there is no further evidence or shuffling. I come out of the showers and under the assumption that my buddies are playing a trick on me, as they so often do, to put this into perspective, both the showers and the guys' cabins are quite a distance away, and there is nothing that can be done to brighten your immediate surroundings. Because of this, people shower before it gets dark and in groups to ensure that nobody gets lost. It's pretty terrifying for someone like me who is by himself and has to navigate his way through the woods. 
To make matters even more difficult, the flashlight I brought along was at the cabin when I got there. As a result, I had no choice but to make my way back with a piece of garbage lantern that provided me with just enough light to see my way around. After that, I decide to grab the lantern, and I begin making my way to the cabin. Around the time that we reached the halfway point, I became aware of an extremely loud moan emanating from directly in front of me. I am so startled that I lose control of the lantern and rush in the other direction of the sound. As I run, I am unable to see anything, and in my hurry, I trip over something. I get up to investigate what I've fallen on and discover that it is soft and drenched in water. As soon as I turn around, I can hear the groaning coming from behind me. So, I hurry in the direction of the cabins. Instantaneously, I'm welcomed by three flashlights and expressions of anxiety on their faces. It would seem that the other campers heard the moaning, and when the counselors went to check, they came upon me instead bruised from head to toe and covered from head to toe in blood. They led me back to the cabin, and as soon as I stepped inside, I was pounced upon with inquiries about what I had just seen. After a time, my companions were able to silence them. The next day, I traveled back home. Would you be able to fault me? After all that I've gone through, there was no way I was going to continue to live there. I'd almost completely blocked out the memory of this occurrence until not too long ago when I was reflecting on it with one of my other friends who had spent time at the camp. I was curious about what took place after I left, so I questioned him about it. His response sent a chill up my spine. It seems that after I went, the groans in the night became louder and closer to the cabins, which scared everyone the freak out. And as for the large mound I landed on, the counselors discovered a deer on the route I was on when they were investigating the source of the cries. The head had been severed from the body, and the entrails had been removed and placed in a separate pile close to the remains of the body. That has been my experience. It's still the most terrifying thing that ever happened to me, even after all these years. Everyone that I've told about it believes that I'm making it up, but my friends who were there have always stood up for me and defended me. I am no closer to understanding what the heck was going on in those woods that night. On to the next one. Outside of famine conditions, people can also set themselves up for Wendigo possession through self-inflicted spiritual sickness, triggered by selfish behavior or careless actions. Among the Ojibwe and Cree, breaking cultural taboos can wound a person's spirit or even negatively affect family members and future generations. It is like bringing a curse upon yourself and your family through irresponsible or excessively prideful behavior. Additionally, Keeping important secrets from others is viewed as a serious transgression. In a culture where everyone relies heavily upon others for their survival, this makes perfect sense. Secrets and grudges can tear at the fabric of society. Holding dark secrets, anger, and resentment inside is like having poison inside one's body. It slowly makes a person sick, and sick people cannot perform needed duties for their community. Spirit and body are fundamentally linked. If someone has a spiritual sickness, it will also manifest in their body through pain or other symptoms of illness. If one is spiritually sick, they are vulnerable for Wendigo possession. Misuse of sacred rituals or performing forbidden acts is also potentially spiritually wounding. For example, if a person who is not trained in proper shamanic techniques tries to communicate with spirits, they risk damaging themselves spiritually. It is like playing with fire. Even those who have many years of training in spirit work and take respectful precautions may still open themselves up to the possibility of something going wrong, especially if they are too reckless out of hubris. 
for an untrained novice attempting to conjure and perform spiritual work is to invite disaster. They open themselves up to Wendigo possession or harm from other powerful Pawaganak. Another example is unsanctioned divination. A popular divination technique among shamans is scapulomancy, that is, the art of divining the future through charred scapulae or spiel bones. Typically, this is performed using deer or elk shoulder blades that have been scorched by fire. The shaman then reads the array of cracks and formations in the bone like a road map. The technique is often used to determine the migration pattern of animals. Through the charred pattern, the shaman is able to decipher where game will be found and increase the odds of a successful hunt. It is a sacred gift and not to be abused. The untrained and especially children are explicitly forbidden from attempting to read the bone. It is an insult to the spirit of the animal that provided the bone. To do so is to bring misfortune and attract the attention of harmful Pawaganak, especially the Wendigo. Sorcery plays an important and prominent role in many Algonquin societies. Not surprisingly, a shaman's power is often assessed by the success rate. Power is also determined by how many Pawaganak or different types a shaman can summon to assist him in his goals. This is usually performed through the shaking tent ritual. In the ritual, a shaman will order the construction of a small conical tent made with a framework of specific trees and covered in animal hides. Usually, the footprint of the tent is only big enough for the shaman, who is usually seated. The tent posts are embedded deep into the ground and held together by wood hoops. Typically, the number of posts is six to eight, but powerful shamans will sometimes build tents with over a dozen posts. This is important because the more posts the tent contain, the more difficult it is to shake. Therefore, if an extremely sturdy tent is able to shake and bend, Sometimes the top will bend almost to the ground. It is proof that spirits are present. Once the shaman enters the sacred base of the tent, it will usually begin to shake immediately, sometimes wildly. Incantations are sung to request an audience of spirits. The Pawaganak are said to gather and sit on the hoops near the top of the tent. They are often described as looking like little people or points of light. As the spirits arrive, they announce their presence by speaking in different voices and will answer the questions of the shaman and those who gathered outside the tent. Each Palgan has a distinct personality. For example, Turtle is often very comical and speaks with a gurgling voice as if he is underwater. Early Canadian fur trader and explorer Alexander Henry the Younger witnessed a shaking tent ceremony. He commented, that it seemed as though multiple voices were coming from the tent. Some yelling, some barking like dogs, some howling like wolves, and in this horrible concert were mingled screams and sobs as of despair, anguish, and the sharpest pain. Articulate speech was also uttered as if from human lips, but in a tongue unknown to any in the audience. It is common for spectators to test shamans by asking questions they couldn't possibly know, like the location of lost articles or the well-being of distant relatives. When difficult questions are answered correctly or miraculously beats are performed, it is believed the Pawaganak are truly present. In one instance, a shaman demonstrated his power by producing fresh blueberries in the dead of winter, a gift from the spirit. Sometimes, victims of Wendigo possession are not the result of situational circumstances like famine or irresponsible behavior. Sometimes they are intentionally targeted through sorcery. The entry point is still via spiritual weakness, but in the cases of Wendigo sorcery, the weakness is the result of a spiritual assault from a sorcerer. A powerful shaman is very respected, but also feared and viewed with a measure of suspicion. They are not to be trifled with. If a person with a degree of spiritual power feels slighted or disrespected, they may choose to target their perceived enemy 
with a magical attack as retribution. There are many cases in which people have been targeted for Wendigo possession by the actions of a sorcerer. In cases of Wendigo sorcery, it is believed that Wendigos are entities made out of a sorcerer's dream. They are controlled by the sorcerer and sent out to do its bidding. One of the most common reasons for magical attack was when a shaman felt insulted after being denied a request for a wife. In Algonquin societies, it is common for men to have multiple wives. A few of these cases are described by Adam Bigmouth in Ojibwe stories from the Upper Burns River. In one case, a powerful conjurer asked to marry a young woman but was denied by her father because he felt the conjurer already had enough wives and also because she was promised to another. The insulted suitor decided to get even. The sorcerer made an effigy of the woman out of snow, dipped it in water, and put it out in the cold to freeze solid. Next, he buried the effigy in ashes and called upon the Wendigo spirit to inhabit the woman using the effigy as a mystical link. He told the father that she would not live long and that her future husband and she would destroy him. He was right. The woman was soon married, but shortly after the marriage ceremony, she began to fall ill. She wouldn't eat and eventually became feverish and complained of having dreams of ice. This went on for weeks. Finally, one day when her husband came home from hunting, she sprang upon him and killed him with an axe. By the time others arrived, on the scene, she had already eaten half of the man's back. It was clear she had gone Wendigo. They had no other choice than to kill her with an axe and burn her body. Like the effigy in possession of the sorcerer, the poor woman's remains now rested among the ashes. In another case, a father denied a suitor because he felt his daughter was not old enough. Some weeks later, the daughter returned home during the afternoon to find her mother still in bed with her infant sibling. She thought it was odd that she would still be in bed at such a late hour, so she called for her to get up. The mother would not move, yet the daughter could see the child moving under the blanket. When she went to rouse her, she found her mother's body cold and lifeless. She threw off the blankets and found the infant covered in blood. It had gone Wendigo and was eating the mother. The Wendigo child had already eaten one breast and was working on the other. She ran to another camp that was close by to seek help. They came back to the home and killed the Wendigo. After it was dead, they noticed ice had formed along the child's backbone. It was believed the Wendigo spirit had been sent as revenge by the insulted suitor. Some magical assaults are direct. In other cases, they are indirect, making it difficult to place blame upon the offending conjurer. Instead of summoning a Wendigo spirit and sending it directly at a victim, conjurers will instead instruct the Wendigo spirit to scare away all the game from the area surrounding a camp. It's a slower process, but the end results are the same. After a long series of unsuccessful hunts, the cursed camp will slowly begin to starve. Then, one by one, people become weak and open themselves up to Wendigo possession. If one of them is possessed and not cured in time, the entire camp could perish. There are also cases of rival sorcerers using Wendigos and other spirits to battle each other. In the role of conjuring in the Salto Society, Irving Hallowell describes one such case. A conjurer may likewise summon to his lodge the soul of a rival conjurer or one he believes to have done him injury for a showdown. Each conjurer then summons all his Pawagana in turn, and there is a battle royale between opposing sides. It is a dramatic struggle to the death right before the eyes of the audience. I was told a story about a contest between conjurers in which my interpreter's great-grandfather, Yellow Legs, Uzuascot, was victorious. There was a conjurer by the name of Link Head, Pijutsuan, who lived on the Winnipeg River 150 miles to the south, he was very powerful, but he was a bad one too. During the winter, he starved out yellow legs by sorcery, and one of the latter's children died. It's an amazing story. Yellow legs called upon another conjurer, his cousin, 
with Bazas to help him destroy Link's head. He agreed and they ordered two conjuring tents to be built. Each tent was made with 40 poles, an astounding number and symbolic of their great power. During the battle, each of their tents shook like trees in a storm. Eventually, after a long battle, Link's head began to lose strength. Everyone could tell because his tent began to shake less and less. They heard him moaning and crying as the end drew near. Finally, the tent became still. Link's head was found dead inside the next morning. Conjurers are also sought out for their ability to protect people from dangers of a supernatural order, including Wendigo. According to Hallowell, a powerful conjurer is able to protect a whole community or specific individuals from malevolent influences. He can determine the source of magically projected illness and even retaliate in kind if he is strong enough. Or he may protect a whole community from the ravages of a Wendigo. If a Wendigo is reported approaching a community, sometimes seen in a dream, a conjurer with the help of his Powaganuk may attempt to stop the Wendigo through magical combat. Conjurers have been known to ward them off by magically hiding their camp or by tricking the Wendigo so that it changes course and avoids the encampment. If an encounter is unavoidable, they may engage in a magical battle. A conjurer may be able to kill a Wendigo if his Powaganak are more powerful than the Wendigo or the rival conjurer who sent it. Once the Wendigo is defeated, the Powaganak will spiritually devour and absorb the Wendigo. However, if the conjurer is not strong enough, the community is doomed. According to indigenous narrative, if not stopped, a single Wendigo can wipe out an entire tribe. This is said to have happened at a place near Sandy Lake, Ontario called Ghost Point. It was once the site of a thriving village until it was destroyed by a Wendigo. One of Hallowell's informants recounts a battle between a conjurer and a Wendigo. He recalls during a terrific blizzard, a Wendigo was reputed to be advancing from the north. The people were so terrified that they moved their wigwams to the south side of the river for several days. During all this time, their strongest conjurer was at work, day and night, overcoming the giant cannibal which was threatening them. A similar report is examined in North Algonquin Cannibalism and Wendigo Psychosis by Charles A. Bishop, where he points to records in the Hudson's Bay Company archives written by Charles Mackenzie of the Laxall Post in 1837. Bishop cites Mackenzie's report documenting the arrival of over 100 Indians who were fleeing in terror from a Wendigo, which several had reported seeing at their lakeside summer camp. They camped next to the store, posted guard, and for weeks the medicine men engaged in conjuring to ward off the evil monster. It's worth noting that Mackenzie also recorded descriptions of the creature from some of the Indian hunters. They described it as covered with hair, lacking heels, the latter perhaps indicating they walked on their forefeet like animals. I hope you enjoyed those encounters. And if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much, and until next time, bye!